Icebergs. As defined by the Urban Dictionary, it is a chart that sorts facts and theories from a piece of media by obscurity, usually the most commonly known subjects near the tip of the iceberg, and the lesser known subjects being near the abyss. Originally, PensyFan19 and I were supposed to be ignorant about each other's projects, but after I revealed it to him that I was making my own video, he was a little bit fired up, but he soon compensated and offered me a collaboration. I took up the offer, excited like nothing else. So here we are, together, about to give you an explanation of Thorax the Railfan's American Railroad Iceberg. Tennessee Pass and the Rail Gorge The Tennessee Pass route is one of the most famous abandoned mountain railroading routes in the western United States. Its construction dates back to 1881, as part of the Denver and Rio Grande Westerns extension to the Aspen area to beat the Colorado Midlands standard gauge route to the rich mining area. Once the line was acquired by the Union Pacific after being operated by the Rio Grande and later the Southern Pacific, Yupi preferred the Moffat Tunnel route and tried to have the line abandoned in 1907, but it has since been sitting idle and unused. 12 miles of the route is owned and operated by the Royal Gorge route out of Canyon City, Colorado. The rest is now owned by Rio Grande Pacific subsidiary Colorado, Midland, and Pacific. There have also been numerous attempts to restore revenue passenger and freight service along the route, but these attempts are ongoing with the Surface Transportation Board. The Great Dismal Swamp Incident on May 18, 1986, NNW-611 was powering an employee special with the NS chairman of that time, Robert B. Clater, at the helm. Approaching a junction in the Suffolk, Virginia area, 611 jumped the tracks, derailing herself and the first two cars. This was likely due to a worn flange on one of the cars picking a switch, which dragged down the rest of the train. There were over 100 injuries, but no deaths. After the accident, NS pumped down all steam special speeds to a limit of 40 miles per hour. The ICC also ruled that contributing factors involved, quote, NOW's decision to use equipment without tight lock couplers and passenger cars with modified interiors having severe injury producing mechanisms. Southern Pacific Santa Fe Merger If you know about the famous Kodachromes, you'll know about this merger. If you don't, let me explain. The 1980s was a time of merger mania, with one Class 1 merging with the other to have competitive advantage due to deregulation. Around this time, the Southern Pacific was interested in merging with the Santa Fe in order to compete against the growing Union Pacific and Burlington Northern Railroads. Based on the previous mergers and acquisitions being approved throughout the U.S., it was considered likely that the Interstate Commerce Commission would approve this one as well. In fact, the two railroads were so confident that the merger would pass that they started painting most of their locomotives into a proposed SPSF livery or Kodachrome scheme, with one railroad painting their letters on their locomotives and then filling in the other once the merger was approved. But to the surprise of almost everyone, the ICC rejected this merger in 1986 as it was deemed anti-competitive. Now people say SPSF stands for shouldn't paint so fast instead of Southern Pacific Santa Fe. And I agree with them, not gonna lie. Richard Jensen Richard Jensen was, and still is, a big name in the rail fanning community. He owned four steam locomotives in the 70s, including such names as CB&Q 05A5632, 01A4960, and GTW K4A5629. A fourth, CB&Q 01A4963, isn't as well known as the other three. We'll start with 5632. She was only in Jensen's hands at the last moments of her life. It was in 1969 when her career ended when she derailed on a switch and the Chicago and Western Indiana didn't have the time to rerail her, and she was scrapped where she sat. 5629 is going to be a long story short. 18 years after we lost 5632, we lost 5629 due to Metra's awful decision to scrap the locomotive. Jensen tried to sue the Metra, but lost the case. Ironically, the same numbers and roads are still survived, but are swapped around. You can do either road number or road name, and they'll still work. 
CBNQ5629 is on display at the Colorado Railroad Museum in Golden, Colorado, while GTW5632 is preserved at Durand, Michigan's Lions Park by the Water Tower. The Ace 3000 the Ace 3000 was a modern take to steam locomotives. Due to the sharply rising costs of diesel fuel, and Ross Rowlands believed that steam was scrapped too soon and had more power than diesels. Although there were actually a few proposals for an Ace 3000, the final concept art of this locomotive resulted in what looks like the cab of an EMD F45 along with a 4442 wheel arrangement and a large coal bunker as the B end. Feasibility testing was done for the project by the Chessie system with CNO Greenbrier 614, who initially had desires to purchase the locomotive, but opted out due to the number of design changes. After the general public's interest to see modern steam died down, the project was ultimately scrapped and will most likely be lost to time. New York Central's M497 Jet Train the Black Beetle, as it's commonly nicknamed, was an experimental jet-powered rail car testbed designed and tested in 1966 for the viability of high-speed rail travel along normal freight trackage with jet engines. The test went well, reaching 183 miles per hour on a stretch of track between Butler, Indiana and Stryker, Ohio, a record that still stands to this day. Unfortunately, New York Central's dream of high-speed rail corridors never came to fruition, and the Black Beetle continued to serve without its jet engines or streamlining into the Penn Central times and even survived in the Conrail, but was scrapped altogether in 1984. The engines were repurposed for a snowblower, numbered X29493. The Roar Turboliner French manufacturer RNS built and exported 13 train sets for Amtrak between 1973 and 1976 for regional trains in the Midwest and Northeast, running on corridors like the Northeast Corridor and the line between Chicago and St. Louis. After seeing the success of the French RTG turboliner, Amtrak ordered another seven turboliner train sets from Roar, known as the RTL turboliners, for intercity service on the Empire Corridor in upstate New York. Amtrak was so pleased with their service that they ordered the RTLs to be rebuilt by Supersteel in 1998 to further extend their service lives. Here, they were repainted with a new Accela-like livery as part of Amtrak's Accela rebranding, but numerous delays pushed back their starting date all the way to 2003, but the first train set was taken out of service only a few months later due to air conditioning problems, with most train sets not turning the wheel in service before being stored. After many years of court hearings between Amtrak and the state of New York over maintenance of the rail cars and the infrastructure, the train sets were auctioned off as surplus in 2012, with all of the sets thought to have been scrapped. However, three train sets were moved from Bear, Delaware in January 2018, with two going to Adams Yard in New Brunswick, pictured here, and with one going to Cedar Hill in New Haven, where they remain stored as of when this video was recorded. The Mark Twain Zephyr train set. The Mark Twain Zephyr was built in 1935 as an early model for the Burlington Road's future fleet of Zephyr train sets. The set would remain in service until April 1958. After retirement, it would change hands several times with various intentions, including plans to sell it to Cuba, a rail themed restaurant and motel in Iowa, the Old Thresher's reunion with the Midwestern Central Railroad, and then being stored at Gateway Rail Services. Finally, the train set was purchased by the Wisconsin Great Northern Railroad in 2020, where it was bought to Trago, Wisconsin. There is currently a restoration effort to operational status by the WGNR for service on its 26-mile line between Spooner and Springbrook, Wisconsin. The City of San Francisco Derailment On August 12, 1939, in Harding, Nevada, the westbound city of San Francisco, heading towards Oakland, California, jumped a rail that had been deliberately moved out of position and camouflaged with brown paint and tumbleweeds. The resulting derailment killed 24 and injured 121 passengers and crew. The investigation was launched and after it was found that the track was sabotaged, a manhunt was called for with a $10,000 reward, but it did little to help. The case remains unsolved to this day. A YouTube channel by the name of Thunderbolt 1000 Siren Productions made a documentary on this derailment, and if you want to go check it out, it'll be linked in the description. Gas Turbine Locomotives 
These were locomotives built with an interesting type of engine, with the prime mover being a gas turbine. Other than the failed experiment with UPM-10002 in 1947, a prototype with a cab on each end was produced in 1948 by General Electric. After this model proved successful, Union Pacific ordered a total of 55 gas turbine locomotives, or TGELs, starting in 1952 as they replaced the service on the railroad's main line. Despite being the strongest locomotives in the world at the time with 8500 horsepower, they consumed a lot of Bunker C fuel, which was becoming expensive due to its use in plastics, and the locomotives also produced a lot of exhausted noise, which eventually led to their retirement in 1969 with two examples in preservation. There was also one occasion where Union Pacific themselves converted an Alco PA to a coal turbine locomotive with tenders from a GTEL, but this experiment would prove an unsuccessful and was scrapped two years later. Other famous gas turbine locomotives in the U.S. include the UAC Turbotrain, the RTG Turboliner, the LIRR GT1, and Bombardier Jet Train. The new build Penn CT1 Breaking Mallard Speed Rubber. Ah, the ambitions of an unconventional man. A group in this context. I'm of course talking about the famous restoration group, the T1 Trust. Their goal? to completely rebuild a Pennsylvania Railroad T1 from the ground up. The group projects the new T1 could go up to 130 miles per hour, breaking the Mallard's long-held record of 126 miles per hour. The reasoning behind this being based on previous claims of a T1 breaking the record by going up to 130 in the past. Will 5550 ever see the destined speed? We shall wait and see. That is, waiting all the way to 2030 which is when this engine is estimated to be completed by. Preserving the sole surviving Baldwin Shark Nose Diesels This is referring to Delaware and Hudson Shark Notes as 1205 and 1216 being preserved on the Escanaba and Lake Superior Railroad since the 1990s. Originally built as New York Central 3805 and 3816, the locomotives were sold to the Monongahela Railway in 1967, then to the Delaware and Hudson in 1974, where they were given the D&H blue, yellow, and silver livery, and then the Michigan Northern Railway in 1978. After both locomotives having a mechanical failure in 1982, they were stored on the nearby Escanaba and Lake Superior Railway along with other rare equipment, where they remain to this day. It was announced in early 2020 that the owner of the Escanaba and Lake Superior was going to make a deal to have the last two surviving Baldwin shark noses donated to a museum of his choosing upon his passing, although it is not confirmed exactly where they will be relocated to at the time this video was made. Union Pacific Buying the Rock Island In 1964, as the Rock Island Railroad found itself losing funds and cutting costs, including maintenance, the company decided that it had to merge with someone else. The timing for this decision was golden. Union Pacific was looking to create a super railroad that would serve a route from Chicago to the West Coast, and the Rock Island Railroad was just the key. But not until late 1974, after years of continuous arguments from the other railroads, did the Europe State Commerce Commission make its ruling in favor of the merger. Meanwhile, the ICC eventually approved a plan that would designate four super systems to cover rail service throughout the western U.S and give UP the Chicago and Omaha mainline. Ultimately, however, the UP Rock Island merger did not become a reality because of regulatory delays and numerous conditions. The long time it took for the ICC to approve of the merger crumbled the Rock Island Railroad, but when it was approved, the UP lost interest in the railroad and completely scrapped the idea. The original Rock Island would survive for another six years until the liquidation of the road commenced on January 24, 1980. The Lost Engines of Roanoke The word lost isn't actually appropriate. Rather, they were just abandoned and left to rust. For several years, a handful of Norfolk and Western steam locomotives and two rare vintage diesels from the Chesapeake and Western were riding away in a Roanoke scrapyard. This included NWW2, number 917, M21118, M21134, M21151, CNW DS44660, number 662 and 663, an NW flat car, and four NW hopper cars. Luckily, 
All of the lost sentients of Roanoke were saved and eventually found homes. As 1188 and 1151 are at the Virginia Museum of Transportation, as well as CNW 662 and 663, along with three NW hoppers, 1134 is on display in Portsmouth, Virginia. 917 is on display as part of a diner in, El in Belleville, Ohio. And the NW flat car is at the North is at Norfolk Lumber along with the other NW Hopper at Goshen, Virginia. CB and Q Doodlebug in Gladstone, Illinois. This is referring to Burlington Route number 9765. This was built back in April of 1930 by EMC Pullman before it became the Electromotive Division. The locomotive would be assigned to mail service before being retired at an unknown date. The locomotive was scrapped in the beginning of 1939, but the body would be saved. It is currently sitting in a backyard in Gladstone, Illinois. It is just barely visible from the street next to the house, however, trees and bushes are starting to grow around it and consume it. It is unknown who owns it or how long it's been sitting there, but preservation is unlikely as it's half of a shell sitting on blocks. Regardless, this would still be one of few, if not the only surviving example of an EMC Burlington Root motor car, or Doodlebug, a type of rail car which used to dominate the remote branch lines of the Burlington and other Midwestern roads like it. However, I do not advise trespassing or going on to the property to gain details, as I am also unsure of where exactly this is. Uinta Railway 50 and 51 Uinta Railway 50 and 51 were the railroad's only articulated locomotives and the only narrow-gauge simple articulated locomotives sold for use in the United States. These Mallet Prairie tanks could handle twice the train load on the 5% grade that it ruled, wrangling 240 tons, 218 tons, up the grade. On the 1.1% grade between Watson and Dragon, 51 was rated at 1,150 tons, at the other extreme, the 7.5% grade between Athea and Baxter Pass brought the tonnage rating down to 145 tons. The units have sold both locomotives in 1940 to the Sumter Valley in Oregon, where they operated until 1947 as 250 and 251. Still yoked in their joint destiny, the two engines then went to the Air National Railways of Central America in Escuintla, Guatemala. 251 retired first in 1962 and 250 followed in 1964. Both were subsequently dismantled after his retirement. Cincinnati and Lake Erie's 1930 Plane Race In 1930, the Cincinnati and Lake Erie Railroad performed a publicity stunt where they raced an airplane from Cincinnati to Dayton with one of their new high-speed Red Devil. The Red Devil just barely beat the airplane, and for the next few years, the CNLE rode on that success, but ultimately, like all other interurban railroads, it fell to the rising popularity of the automobile. However, most of the race was filmed as part of a Pathé newsreel, and the newsreel footage can be seen in Heron Rail Video's documentary on the Cincinnati and Lake Erie Railroad. The Red Devil high-speed car that was used in the race did not survive in the preservation, however, at least three other Red Devils have. North America's Other Three-Cylinder Steam Locomotives there are a few more three-cylinder steam locomotives preserved in the United States, other than the 9000 series and SP-1. The first example is Alton and Southern 080 Switcher No. 12. Built by Alcos Konecki in August 1926, this locomotive would mainly haul freight trains up and down the system. Currently, the locomotive is stored at the National Museum of Transportation in St. Louis. Another three-cylinder locomotive is farther east, specifically at the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia. This building houses Baldwin's 60,000 locomotive, 4102 No. 60,000, built in 1926. It was an experimental locomotive designed to test the viability of having a third cylinder. Meanwhile, Rio Grande, Lackawanna, and the New Haven had three cylinder 482s. The Lehigh Valley had a three cylinder 482. The Belt Rally of Chicago and the Indiana Harbor Belt had three cylinder 080s, which were popularized by AHM and Riverossi during the 1970s and HO and O scale, respectively. In Louisville and Nashville, the Rock Island and the Wabash tried three cylinder Pacific Simicados, but most of them were unsuccessful and scrapped before World War II, though the Wabash rebuilt their Mikados into their famous Hudsons. Mexico had a small fleet of three cylinder Pacifics. And they were so successful that they wound up being the last three cylinder steam locomotives left in operation in North America when they were retired in the 1960s. Bessemer and Lake Erie 643 being restored to operation. 
Bessemer in Lake Erie 643 is the sole survivor of the railroad's fleet of 47 H1210 Ford Texas type locomotives built by Baldwin Locomotive Works between 1929 and 1944. After her retirement sometime in the early 1950s, the Bessemer in Lake Erie preserved her in a consolidation number 154, which is preserved at the Henry Ford Museum in Dearborn, Michigan. Back to 643. In 1983, Glenn Campbell won the auction for 643 from Steamtown and moved it to the Union Railroad shops in Hall, Pennsylvania. Ten years later, 643 was moved to Campbell's Skull, the b and shops in McKees Rocks, Pennsylvania. After about a few years of restoration, even getting to a completed state, Campbell realized there was no place to run the large engine due to its large frame, so the project was diminished and it just sat at the McKees Rocks for several years having been moved outside in 2006 due to a snowstorm causing the support beams for the shed to crack. On August 5th, 2019, the future was brightened up as the H Steam Roundhouse announced that it bought the locomotive and will be planning to cosmetically restore her. You can follow the updates on the H Steam Roundhouse's official website. New York Central 440 number 999 reaching 100 miles per hour. New York Central and Hudson River American No. 999 was built by MIC's West Albany shops in 1893. During her first run, the crew recorded a 102.8 mph top speed on May 9th and a 112.5 top speed the next day on the stretch of line between Batavia and Buffalo, New York, whilst hauling the Empire State Express. But there are two opposing sides to this claim to fame. One saying she did reach 112 miles per hour, and another where she topped out at 81. It's been a debate that's been ongoing for years, and with no extra information, it's a mystery if she did reach 100 plus miles per hour or not. Today, the authentic 999 is preserved at the Chicago Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. A similar locomotive that comes to mind with the claim of being the first would be Great Western City of Truro, since they have the same wheel arrangement and the same claim of achieving 100 miles per hour, albeit questionable. I personally believe 999 was able to achieve this speed since the New York Central's water level route is flat, has a lot of segments of straight track, and would give the locomotive with its few cars enough time to gain such speeds. Tank Shan 1689 Susquehanna 141 In 1991, the New York Susquehanna and Western was looking to do steam excursions around their system, but they didn't want to take other steam locomotives from other museums. So they decided to get a new one from the only company that manufactured steam in the world, Tangshan Railway Vehicles in Tangshan, China. But unfortunately, yet mysteriously, while in the Indian Ocean, the ship carrying the locomotive capsized, taking the engine with it. The MYS and W was saddened by this, but they went with Plan B. They bought Valley Road's SY1647M and renumbered it to 142. Now, the locomotive is based out of Phillipsburg, New Jersey on the Delaware River Railroad excursion and is currently out of service pending restoration. Meanwhile, 1689 is still sitting in the bottom of the Bay of Bengal, but it would be very costly to lift it up from the water, and due to the condition the engine would be in from sitting on the water for over 40 years, it would be too costly to restore. Kansas City Southern and Illinois Central Merger On July 19, 1994, Illinois Central announced that they would be purchasing the Kansas City Southern for $1.6 billion. However, this merger was called off only a few months later in October after the two railroads failed to come to a definitive agreement on a number of issues, likely due to Illinois Central's stock price having fallen by more than $3 a share since the intent of a merger was announced. Two interesting points to note around this time is that Burlington Northern was also interested in purchasing KCS if their attempt to merge with the Santa Fe against Union Pacific failed, and that KCS already gained the Shreveport to Meridian Speedway, which was originally part of Illinois Central. Ironically, both of these railroads have been acquired by Canadian National after this merger attempt, that is if the STB allows CN to purchase KCS as of when this video was made. Speed Rail This is another interurban related entry. When the Milwaukee Electric Railway and Light Company abandoned or cut back most of their routes due to competition from automobiles and buses, the two remaining services from Waukesha and Hales Corner were transferred to various public transportation companies, and later to J. Mader, 
who formed the Milwaukee Rapid Transit and Speed Rail Company, also known as Speed Rail. Their first run was held on September 2, 1949, and they operated articulated and heavyweight inner urban cars inherited from TMERNL, as well as six lightweight cars from Cleveland. Based on its late starting date, this is likely the last inner urban to be formed in the US. Sadly, it's not here with us due to a nasty accident that happened. In 1950, two specials collided head on, killing over a dozen and injuring about 50. This is what eventually led to the demise of Speedrail eventually closing down its last route on March 2, 1958. 60 years and 8 months later, Milwaukee would bring back streetcars with the service named The Hop, which runs a short 2.1 mile line between Burns Commons and the Milwaukee Intermodal Station, stopping at 16 places before terminating at the latter location. EMD DD40 This locomotive is similar to the EMD DD35 and was likely the original proposal for the wide cab DD40 AX, which would later see production. Based on its name, the locomotive would have about 1,500 horsepower more than the DD35, but a standard cab identical to the DD35. Interestingly enough, the class has been adapted in numerous liveries by Athern and HO Gage during the 1980s for railroads including the Baltimore and Ohio, Burlington, Pennsylvania, Southern Pacific, and Union Pacific, likely the only operator of this giant if it existed. Pre-1970 Burlington Northern Merger The four railroads involved in the Burlington Northern Railroad have actually been closely linked since the beginning of their creation, with numerous attempts to bring them together. This topic goes all the way back to 1896, when James J. Hill, a railroad tycoon who founded the Great Northern Railroad, purchased an interest in the Northern Pacific to save it from financial woes. Here, he tried to merge the two Northern Railroads, but this plan was rejected by Northern Pacific officials. Five years later, in 1901, both railroads purchased a large amount of shares from the Burlington route, which allowed them access to Chicago, and Hill tried to merge the three railroads with the Northern Securities Company, but this trust was disbanded a few years later under the Sherman Antitrust Act. The Spokane, Portland, and Seattle Railroad was then created in 1905 and was jointly owned by Great Northern and Northern Pacific, primarily for service between Spokane and Portland. Later on, these railroads attempted to merge in 1927 and 1955, both attempts being rejected for unknown reasons, until another attempt in 1970 proved successful and became the Burlington Northern Railroad, finally making Hill's dream come true. High Iron Productions made a video on the Burlington Northern for further information on the railroad. New York Central's B-25 Mitchell Airplane during the Second World War, the New York Central and its employees raised funds to purchase two B-25 Mitchell planes at $170 million each, claiming to be the only railroad to have done so and donated them to the war effort. Each plane was painted with the name New York Central and was flown by Army Air Force crews in World War II. At this time, the New York Central's company magazine, The Headlight, was filled with photos of railroad employees off at war and updates on their sponsored planes were always a headlight for those in the U.S. Unfortunately, the first plane was lost in 1943, so the New York Central raised the funds again to purchase and donate a second plane, this time named New York Central 2, thus being the first, if not only, group to purchase a second plane to be donated. A South African Garrett in the United States Robert Butcher visited South Africa numerous times during the 1960s and 70s where he was fascinated by the narrow gauge steam operations of the South African railways. Here, he documented the railroad's operations, specifically along the Escort to Wienen branch until its closure in 1983. This led him to purchase two South African locomotives which worked on the route and bring them back to the US, where they have remained ever since in good condition. This included South African Class NG G13 No. 50, the Garrett mentioned in this topic, along with South African Railways 282 Class 11 No. 18 at the Hampstead and Northern Railroad in Hampstead, Texas. This two-foot gauge railroad is private and I cannot find the exact location of the small collection and set of tracks, 
but the railroad is used for visiting friends, and photos are occasionally taken of the locomotives to document North America's only garret. The Steam Locomotives in Merrill, Oregon and McLeod, California On a Modoc northern siding south of the main town and closer north to the Oregon-California border lies 11 almost neglected steam locomotives. This is the dying collection of Fred Kepner, which was moved from McLeod, California to various locations before finally being stored in Merrill, Oregon. Unfortunately, we haven't heard of anything regarding the future of this collection. Most people are suggesting that the 11 locomotives that he has will be lost to time if he doesn't give up his entire collection to someone else. Conrail Steam Excursion Program After the Chessy Steam Special, Ross Rowland was interested in Conrail, another newly formed freight railroad, to hold excursions with Reading 2101. However, this plan was declined due to the railroad being only two years old at this time, sorting out other matters such as line abandons and consolidation. In the mid-1980s, Conrail's new CEO, Richard Sanborn, was looking to get the railroad into the steam excursion fad. They first chose the New York Central 482 to be the leader of the steam program, number 3001 at the National New York Central Railroad Museum in Elgard, Indiana. Unfortunately, three events happened that would crush the hopes and dreams of Conrail's steam program. First was Norfolk Southern's Dismal Swamp Incident in 1986 with 611, mentioned previously. Then there was the Chase, Maryland Accident in 1987. And finally, the last nail in the coffin, Sanborn's unfortunate passing on February 12, 1989. Before his death, Sanborn was in the process of going over the specifics for CNO 2716 to run an excursion for Conrail. Lionel has recently made an O-gauge model of 2101 in its proposed Conrail livery to showcase what the engine would have looked like if this project was carried out. CB&Q Passenger Cars in Saudi Arabia This was the work of a Kansas City banker by the name of Alexander J. Barkett. This person briefly owned the Mark Twain Zephyr starting in June 1979 and ending in 1980, three months before he passed, which we talked about earlier. But three years before the acquisition, he would sell nearly two dozen Burlington passenger cars, which he refers prior to the sale, from many different named Zephyrs of the Burlington, to the Royal Saudi Railroad in Saudi Arabia. He did this because he had to pay off mounting legal bills. These cars included a five-unit Nebraska Zephyr set, along with a complete semi-articulated Denver Zephyr set, and the remaining cars coming from the second Denver Zephyr set, along with other Burlington coaches. The cars proved unsuccessful in the deserts of Saudi Arabia and were pulled from service after a short time. There has been some speculation of whether these rail cars still exist as of when this video was made, but somewhat recent satellite photos have shown what looks to be the Nebraska Zephyr set stored in a yard in Ad Damam. Union Pacific's Third Batch of Big Boys Classic Trains Magazine did an article discussing Union Pacific's Third Batch of Big Boys. Union Pacific was going to order 5 or 10 more, and they were going to be oil-fired so that they could run on the Salt Lake and Los Angeles subdivisions, thus allowing the big boys to run in California. The war ended before they could be built, and after the war, UP was more interested in dieselizing than buying steam locomotives. Santa Fe 3751 attending Train Fest 2011 in July 2011, the San Bernardino Railroad Historical Society agreed to let their famous engine, Santa Fe 484-3751, built by Baldwin in 1927, make a 5,000-mile round trip to and from TrainFest 2011 in Rock Island, Illinois. Well, it was supposed to. The idea was candid, BNSF refusing to allow 3751 to travel on their main line. This is due to an increase of freight volumes during the proposed traveling dates of the steam locomotive, and the lines of rail fans along the route, which would require monitoring by BNSF, which would greatly complicate operations on an already busy corridor. 3751 was still going out and about in 2011, just not as far east as Rock Island, Illinois. The engine was invited by Amtrak to be on display at Los Angeles Union Station for National Train Day, and also ran a couple of excursions in the Los Angeles area. Santa Fe and Erie Lackawanna Merger on May 30, 1975, an 85-page report titled Erie Lackawanna Railway Company, Proposal for Acquisition, was conducted by the Santa Fe Railroad of merging with the Erie Lackawanna, since the SF was the largest interchange partner with the EL. 
This would have created the nation's first coast-to-coast -coast railroad spanning from the Atlantic to the Pacific Oceans from the New York to Los Angeles regions. Major sources of traffic which would help the struggling railroads would be the automotive and steel industries, along with USPS traffic in later years. However, this proposal was rejected since the Erie Lackawanna already agreed to be a part of Conrail, which was scheduled to commence a few months after the paper was drafted. The Erie Lackawanna, in particular, suffered from poor track maintenance and fewer industries due to the railroad not stopping at major cities, which its competitors did. These aspects and more made the Erie Lackawanna an unattractive merger partner in a land of merging railroads. Alternate Rock Island Bicentennial Units The 20th Century Railroad Club of Chicago held a contest to design a bicentennial paint scheme for the Rock Island. The original rinning design by Andy Romano was a patriotic navy stars and striped blue with the word independence italicized and stretched to simulate the white stripes on our flag. There was no the rock on the tail end either. The winner's design was altered and powder blue was used in place of the patriotic blue, lightly to match the existing powder blue and white livery of their freight locomotives at the time. Needless to say, Romano was disappointed since the dramatic effect of the original design was ruined. Trains Magazine did an article on the contest in the original sketch of the winning design in the original dark blue colors is featured in that article, but I was unable to find the original sketch or the article. Alco's C636P In the late 1960s, Alco drew up plans for a C636 cow-bodied diesel locomotive, but they were never built or sold because they were advertised at the worst possible time. These were promoted in the 1960s during a time when passenger trains were losing money, and the last thing most railroads wanted was new passenger locomotives. The actual sale numbers for new passenger locomotives such as the SDP-40, SDP-45, and FP-45 were quite low, with most of these locomotives later being reassigned to freight service, and the Santa Fe was having enough problems with their U-28CG and U-30CGs as it was. Based on the drawings, it looks like a cross between the lead unit of the Union Pacific GTELs and an ALCO PA. Luckily, someone kitbashed to one in N scale. Boxcar Barns Prominently in the Midwest and Southwest, it would be quite the sight to see these laying around in farms or deserts. Basically, what farm and ranch owners have done is they buy a boxcar from wherever possible, transport it to their homes, strip the car of its wheels, not some not doing that, and place it in or around their barns as a means of support. There's plenty of examples of this in action, and to be fair, it's quite the lovely sight to see old cars being repurposed for something else.